Um, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, John Paul Rico, who is a queer theorist, curator, and professor of contemporary art uh, at the University of Toronto, at the University of Toronto at Mississauga, and in the Department of Fac uh, uh, what is it? Department of Comparative Literature Pro uh, Center. <sighs> Everything in Canada is a center, isn't it? And our own department, the Department of our Art. Um, he is a professor of contemporary art, visual culture, and comparative literature. He's curated a number of exhibitions of queer art, including the snappily named Fago Sites uh, in Chicago, disappeared in Chicago, and most recently, 2016, 1996, an exhibition you can see online at Visual Aids, and in the most recent issue of the journal Drain, dedicated to AIDS and memory. John is the author of The Logic of the Lure and The Decision Between Us. Uh, he's the organizer of Sex, Ethics, and Publics, a new collaborative research working group based in Toronto. And he has asked me to mention this, which is um, a visit by Bruce Benderson, uh, who reads new work and, in, and joins John in conversation on literature, sex, and writing uh, on October the 20th, that's next Thursday, at 7 p.m. in, weirdly enough, Emmanuel College. Um, should we leave this here for people to look at? Um, John is a formidable and annoyingly formidable intellect. Um, in reviewing the decision between us, art and ethics in the time of scenes, in no less a journal than critical inquiry, or inquiry, as I believe it said, um, Tom, Tom McDonough gave a val valuable summation of John's work. Rico insists that being, including the being of the artwork, is always being together, a sharing or partaking of the world. That is, at the same time, also necessarily a sustaining of the space of separation. And McDonough argues that in John's work, this leads, might lead to an aesthetics that refuses those dialectical syntheses um, that we're also wedded to that's not McDonough's term, it's mine. Um, dialectical syntheses of interpretation traditionally favored by the discipline of art history. Uh, and instead, John attends to gaps, aporia, what is unreconcilable or impassable in artwork and in our experience of it. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the introduction. And um, uh, thank you, Brenda and the rest, for the invitation to participate. I, it's a real pleasure to be a part of this panel. Um, curating is something that I just do every once in a while. Um, and any opportunity I have to then talk about uh, curating in general, as well as my own, uh, is a welcomed occasion. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, add uh, video art uh, to the uh, roster of, um, of art forms and uh, media and genres as we move from, from print to photography, now on to uh, video, by um, at least initially grounding my comments in, a, um, uh, in an exhibition, a two-part exhibition, that I put together back in, um, well, that was shown in 2008, in the winter of 2008, at V-Tape here in uh, Toronto. Uh, I'm sure most of you um, are familiar with V-Tape. If you're not, it's one of the preeminent international uh, uh, archives of, uh, of video art, and we're very lucky to have it here. And it has certainly been um, uh, a place here in Toronto that has supported um, curating around um, the issues that we're talking about um, this evening. So it was as a curator in residence at um, V-Tape that I um, was asked to put together this two-part exhibition of queer video 
dating from the early 90s up to um, that uh, present. And um, the first part was titled Love in a Time of Empty Promises, and it ran from some in January, February of 2008. And it, um, maybe I should call up, in the meantime, let's see. Yeah. Um, it brought together recent work by six international artists, all of which um, stage the um, irresolvable gap between desire and image, uh, desire and enunciation. It's an impasse that these works, um, it's an impasse that these works enable us to experience and to theorize as the space of love and intimacy, as love and intimacy bear upon sex and sexuality. For instance, in Deirdre uh, Logue's work from 2005 entitled Per Se, and uh, Deirdre is a Toronto-based um, uh, artist, and in um, Doug Ishar's uh, BRB from 2007, the voice, a voice, uh, or more than one voice, is its own internally divided space of enunciation. Um, you can get a sense of this if we go back to Deirdre's. Um, I can show you, it's a short video, it's a minute or two, and uh, What I really want to say is private. So what makes it so hard to say is that I don't really understand it per se. And so what I really want to know is how I can say it even though it's still private and you can know it without me telling you per se. Oh, okay, so it's just a little, it's the first minute or so of I think a four or five minute clip that continues in this way of trying to speak and trying to say something that is difficult to say, wanting to say how difficult it is to say, and then uh, adding on the tail end of each of these moments of, of, uh, of uh, stammering uh, the phrase uh, per se um, as such, right, as is. Um, a kind of undermining of that, um, of that, um, that um, exactitude, right? That sort of correspondence. Okay, I think these these works, um, Doug's, which, by the way, is. Um, uh, a video uh, shot from a moving vehicle through the, I believe, Southern California desert that then has running along the bottom the transcription of a online chat that he had with um, another guy. Um, and the title of the video, BRB, it refers to is um, an abbreviation that's um, uh, vernacular and um, local to these online chats, right? Uh, uh, meaning short for be right back.
right? Um, so again, something there about the return and the promise of the return and coming back. Um, and so this is just one of the ways in which the video is shown on a monitor uh, with um, with one of the with the screen capture, right? With that one bit of of text. Um, so I think these works, Deer Trees and Doug's, as well as the works by the other artists in the show, which um, I won't be talking about, they attest to the difficulty of communicating imagined desires and desired images. And they invite us to consider how the force of desire and of love is at once a force of divestiture and of opening or exposure, such that the promise lies in this very emptying out of language, of meaning, of signification, of connection, which is to say in the promise that is that impasse, that impasse between desire and image, desire and enunciation. Okay, part two um, of the exhibition was titled Sex is So Abstract. And that ran from March to April of 2008. Whereas Love in a Time of Empty Promises was inspired by uh, Jean Genet's film Enchant de Moore of 1950, part two was inspired by Andy Warhol's observation that, quote, sex is so abstract. Abstract in the sense of what of sex remains anonymous and impersonal and thus irreducible to identity or the union of any two or more identities. So together, the two parts of the curatorial project represent my approach to curating sex, namely by presenting sex without optimism and without recognition. Without optimism in the sense of without a hope-driven narrative telos, including in the form of a happy ending, in all senses of that phrase, hence love in a time of empty promises and without recognition in the sense of being without legible identity and mutuality, hence sex is so abstract. In both cases, sex is the risk, but also the pleasure, and sometimes both the pleasure and the risk at once, that your fantasy of self-coherence no longer remains intact. In other words, the risk and pleasure of no longer being a subject, or perhaps even an object, including for another subject. So, the erasure of futurity, this anonymity of encounter, the abasement of the ordinary, as the here now this of queer sociality and sexuality, is the emptying, emptying and abstracting that the cur curatorial project sought to explore and present. In fact, those two things, emptying and abstracting, were operative in both shows, and the project ended up trying to think them together Yet, emptying and abstracting not in terms of deprivation, negation, or hard-edged limits, but rather in terms of overflowing the bounds of the geometric, the corporeal, the discursive, and the intersubjective, which is to say that which exceeds sex and sexuality. Um, so here's Warhol's, um, some of his so-called body parts. Uh, uh, prints, which might be the kind of image visual correlation to his statement, sex is so abstract, to give you a sense of what he might have meant by that. Um, but I think it also uh, corresponds to his um, oxidation paintings, that is, those uh, paintings that um, were made on um, uh, metal plates. Uh, by uh, having, he asked uh, young men to urinate on them and the urine uh, 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 oxidized the, um, uh, the metal to create these, uh, uh, this sort of funny play on Jackson Pollock's uh, drip method and other such forms of abstraction, painterly abstraction. So another kind of emptying out, right, that becomes another kind of abstracting, thinking the emptying out and the waste, the object, and the abstract. Okay, another figure for this, funny enough, might be 
Nancy Harrington, uh, the character, the curator of contemporary art in Miranda July's film, Me, You, and Everyone We Know, which came out just two years before my residency at V-Tape. So that was in, uh, the film was uh, 2005. As you might recall, she's revealed to be something of a sexual pervert who, while in an online sex chat, she goes, of course, by the anonymous handle, untitled, uh, finds herself turned on by what Night Warrior is writing in the chat. In particular, the scatological fantasy that reads, and if you have seen the film, uh, you remember this line. I'll poop in your butthole and you will poop it back into my butt and we will keep doing it back and forth with the same poop forever. Unbeknownst to Nancy, she is chatting with two young boys. Uh, one I think is 14, the other one is six. She arranges to meet in a park with Robbie, the younger one, the six-year-old. And this is a still from the, from the film where they're now having this remarkable encounter. I'm interested in the ideogram that the boys create to illustrate this infinite exchange, I, which, is, which is this one, which became part of the campaign for the, uh, for the film. So you have the two pairs of opening parentheses f facing away from each other, and those are the two butts, and then the greater uh, sign uh, those also facing each other. So two butts with arrow-shaped openings facing each other, right? Um, I'm interested in this because it is in its porn uh, graphology that this emoticon, like all emoticons, inscribes sex, or better, its abject perversion as something that is so abstract. But it is precisely in the ability to read this erotic hieroglyphics as symbolizing a mutually assured exposure to excess, that is, to a mutual greater than-ness, right, that they're sharing in this, those are greater than signs and they're kind of corresponding to each other, that one can read this as symbolizing what I'm describing as a mutually shared exposure to excess, to a mutual greater than and in the pair of open parentheses turned outward and away from each other that we have a script for a kind of all of this, a kind of, I'm going to say, a curatorial method around sex and its excesses in which the abstract and the abject are to be thought together as two versions of perversion and literally being the rejection of any path, tract, trait, or ject of bodies and pleasures that would be relegated to the intelligibility and desirability of a sexual subject or object. So the question arises, why sex or why sexuality? As Michel Foucault pointed out in the final chapter of his book, The History of Sexuality, sex, that thing that we call sex, is a complex idea formed within and subordinate to the discourse and deployment of sexuality. As he writes at one point, sex is the most speculative, most ideal, and most internal element in a deployment of sexuality organized by power in its grip on bodies and their materiality, their forces, energies, sensations, and pleasures. Foucault's lesson is simple. We need to free ourselves from both sex and sexuality in order to care for, curate, bodies and pleasures, their sensations, promiscuities, and material excesses. Precisely as those things that neither sex nor sexuality can recognize as their own, being impossible subjects and objects, and that expose us to what might be called or described as the curatorial impossible. Thank you.